and uh, and the one next door was uh, uh, Ritterbush had the had the Budweiser beer right across from the fence door. On, uh, he was right east of the Crest Building, and uh, uh, Emil Ritterbush uh, moved from there into this building up here, and he had it. He moved his beer tavern up there first in that building, and uh, and then he uh, uh, and then uh, uh, re uh, uh, well I don't know whether it's Ralph or Clarence Keesper or both of them together. They rented that building and they started it up, and they were playing poker. They we'd play poker in the back, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, and they put Jack Cahill in there to run it. That's who they put Jack Cahill. Jack Cahill in there to run it. And Jack Cahill had that building there. And he uh, he sold hot links and I don't know if he sold beer or not uh, when he had that. Uh, I just don't know whether, but Jack Cahill, uh, uh, Taylor's, Taylor's had that first, and uh, and and they put Jack Cahill in there, and they had poker games in the bag. And uh, they had big players come in and play. Yeah, they they had quite a few pretty good poker players come in there. Eve Williams, and Bob Story, and uh, uh, oh, there's a lot of different ones come in there, been in there and played. They ever get in any? Fights or anything? Yeah, they got some fights in there too. <laughs> uh, uh, Olin Horn, he is from Oklahoma City, and he come up there and was playing poker. And uh, Otto Jack Mullaw, he was in there. And uh, uh, Otto was dealing the card, and and Olin Horn and uh, and Bob Story they got into an argument about a pot, and old Olin Horn he was kind of drinking, of course, and he said uh, he said uh, uh, I didn't like that uh, old uh, Bob Story got him all his hundred dollar change in, and he got. And he got Olin Horn in for a hundred dollars, and a hundred dollar change, yeah, on one hand, and he stayed fat with a nine. And Olin Horn drawed his hand and missed it. And Olin kept saying, he sitting right next to Otto Jackson. He said, uh, <coughs> he said, I didn't like that deal. And uh, he said it two or three times. And old Otto said, well, if you didn't like the deal, he said you know what you can do about it. <laughs> and and uh, old Olin Horn sat there sat there for a while and went on for a minute or so and he took his glasses off and he laid them down at his table sitting over there right behind him. And he laid them down on that table and he was sitting this way and and uh, Otto Jack was sitting over here and Olin Horn was sitting on this side of him and uh, when he took them glasses off he come around he come around with his hand like that with a chop and he chopped it would come down with his hand like that at Otto, and Otto caught his blow, and they got into it. Oh, mercy. <laughs> and, and they, uh, 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 they was both pretty bloody when it was over. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they had done it with their hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they didn't use nothing but their hands. <laughs> well, what year was it that Minnesota Pats was down? Well, uh, that was... When he played over to Vincidor and Ray Wicks went over there and played him, Bernie Merton had that then. Mm -hmm. And Ray Wicks, I, Ray Wicks told me after he played him, he said, I went over and played, he went over and played with him. And he said that I was just holding the stick. And Ray was, Ray was one of the best pool players, or snooker players in town. Mm -hmm. And he said he was just holding the stick. So <laughs> Minnesota Fats. Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, uh, Another time, uh, Jack Cahill and then McMahon boys from out around Cashin 
they was betting a hundred dollars a game, and they had Jack that, that this guy couldn't beat Jack Cahill, and they lost six or seven hundred, five six hundred dollars something like that. And one of them come over and said, "Ask Ray Wick." Ray Wick and I was standing there watching the game, and he asked. Uh, Ray Wick said, "Do you think you could beat him?" And Ray said, "No." Said, "I don't think I don't think I can." And they said, well, would you play him? He said, no. He said, I don't want to play him. He said, well, I'm pretty sure I can't beat him. And he was a, he was a, uh, he wasn't so sure. Oh, he's ordinary height. And he's kind of heavy set, and he had a, a flat top haircut. He's a blonde-headed guy. And uh, uh, somebody asked him what he did, and he said he sold, uh, uh, sold uh, uh, surgical supplies to the hospital. So that's all I ever didn't know about him. And uh, but he uh, he beat Jack out of uh, he beat them McMahon boys putting up the money on it. Yeah. Jack wasn't putting up the money. Yeah. But uh, uh, they, they beat them for five or six hundred dollars something like that. And what, oh, go ahead. When was that building built? Uh, the one where the pool hall's at yeah. now. Uh, I don't, if they don't tell up there, I don't know. Most of them tell when they were built, a big part of them do, but I don't think that one, but it was built long about in the time all of the rest of the buildings were built. Along. You know who built it? No, I don't know who built it. I just don't know who built it. But uh, I, I remember when uh, Ritter Bush, Ritter Bush moved his, his, his beer tavern from Oklahoma Street, it was right east of Cress's. And he moved it over there, and he had that before uh, the Vencedor went out. And when the Vencedor went out, uh, John Gooch, uh, uh, he got a bunch of boys to help him move that stuff, and they moved all that stuff at night. They had yeah. to have it moved, moved, and he moved it, moved it in there, and uh, and he moved he moved that them pool tables and that stuff. He moved that in there. Uh, I don't remember just exactly when it was, but after, but later on, now before John got it, uh, now, uh, 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 what was that Freeman, Freeman that used to bootleg it? D. Freeman. D. Freeman, he, he sold whiskey upstairs, and in the Little Rock building, they... Did he make his whiskey upstairs, or just no, sell it? No, he bought nothing but, he bought nothing but, uh, uh, Bonded whiskey. Then he, he, it was all bonded whiskey that he bought and sold, and he had hiding places around in there. And no, he, the hiding places upstairs. Yeah, and and uh, then he put it downstairs in that rock building, and they'd come in there and buy it. Yeah. Where'd he get his whiskey? Uh, he got it from. I think he got it in Kansas someplace. Uh, I think Kansas at all. Was there any moonshiners in no, there that no, ever? No, nothing but. Uh, all all D. Freeman ever sold in there was was a uh, bonded whiskey. Yeah. How did they get the whiskey down here? Does anyone know? Well, <laughs> they uh, a lot of it was hauled down from Kansas. Is, is hauled down from Kansas first. They go up in Kansas. And what they just take see, runners from here, go pick it up. They they'd go up there and load it up and haul it down here. And uh, 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 <clears throat> When they when they sold it and they sold it in the little rock building out there. Mm -hmm. And where's the little rock building? Right in behind the pool all there. Mm -hmm. It's on the it's on the same lots. It's right in behind there. Well, and, and they used to have poker games back there. Now where Bert, the garage is? Bert Stevens. No, where the garage is back yeah. there. Bert Stevens had that, and, and he had, and they played poker there and cards in the back, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they played a lot of poker there for him, and. Uh, 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 Bert Stevens had it, and uh, and D. Freeman had it, and Ritterbush was in there for a while with his beer tavern, and I don't know what was in there before. Uh, Nell Cahill had a meat market along in there someplace. It's mm. from there on up towards the. But uh, uh, but I remember when Freeman was in there, and uh, and when Ritterbush was in there, and Freeman, 
And when Bert Stevens had to back in, and they played poker back there. And that's about all I know about that building. But I, I, now, I don't know where uh, Mel Cahill had his meat market. Well, it was, it was in, it was, it was up that, it was back up that way from, it was back up that way from Wix's. I'm not sure which one it was. What was the Vincidora? The Vincidora was, uh, the, the corner, the Vincidora was, uh, it was there for, when we first moved up here in 1918. Uh, how to get its name? Do you know? Was no, it the I man's don't. wife? Or it, it was. Someone had told me his name was Vince and her name was Dora. Or I, something. I, I, don't, I didn't know about. I, I don't either. I didn't know about that, but I, I, I remember it was there. It was right next to the, uh, the Al Drugstore, and uh, and then it was the Vince door, and it, it's in that building where the Dollar General store is at now. It was. Uh, it was a, I don't know whether it was a, I think it was a, I think it's in that building, it was in that building there where the Vincidora was at. Now was the Vincidora, was it another uh, pool hall or? What? Yeah, it was a billiard, uh, billiard, snooker and Same billiards. Same thing, only different location. And pool, it had pool tables, snooker and billiard tables. Who owned it? Uh, Bernie Merton. And uh, and then when Bernie Merton got out of there, well, they had to move that stuff, and they moved it over over there to this building. John Gooch bought the equipment and moved it over in that building, and then he had it. Well, I I just don't know all the details of that, but I do know that Ritter Bush was in there with the beer tavern when he moved off of Oklahoma Street over there, and then. And, and then uh, uh, D. Freeman had it. And uh, when did he have it? Well, I, I just can't call the years that he had it. That he was in there, but he never sold no bootleg whiskey. He, I remember he when sold he sold a lot of whiskey, though. Uh, but he he he, uh, he had he bought a federal stamp, federal liquor stamp, and he sold the whiskey there. And I don't think he hauled it himself. I think somebody brought it in. To what about doing prohibition? Well, there was a lot of bootleggers then. <laughs> during prohibition, do, uh, during prohibition, they would arrest these people uh, if they could find out anybody had a steal or something or making whiskey. They'd arrest them. See. And uh, well, I know of several people that play in there today that had steals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're still playing. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's one down there right now that had steel. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that prohibition was something else. That prohibition, that was the uh, the prohibition was put through. Well, there was there was lots of people, lots of drinking went on before prohibition, and people would go up and, and get to drinking and, and drinking and everything. And then they, then they got prohibition, but the churches was behind. But all the churches was behind the, for prohibition when they got when they, through the legislation to get prohibition. To, but uh, the people that drank never did quit drinking. They just kept on drinking. Mm -hmm. And instead of uh, instead of getting their whiskey, they they started making it, and, and uh, they'd make the whiskey, and then they'd had people in town that sold it. And, ones out in the country would make it in places. They'd bring it to town, they'd sell it in different places. Yeah. Do you remember where some of the old steels was? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, uh, uh, my brother had a steel, and we made a lot of whiskey. We made a lot of whiskey, and uh, 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 and the Federals got on to it, and they come and the federal, the three federal agents out of Enid come, come and raided my brother's place. Where was it? It was out between Guthrie and Crescent. And, uh... Farm's still there. And, uh, they, uh, 
they, they came out there and they, somebody, somebody skipped them. I don't know how they ever, for sure how they come to find it. But, uh, Do you have any idea? Well, uh, <laughs> they said that, they said that those guys would stop down at Dutch Stance, Dutch Stance is over there, and ask them where they could get some whiskey. Said they were buying mules. Said, you don't know where we're getting your whiskey at, do you? And he told him, he told him about the place. And so I, I don't know just how, but they, they come up there and they found it, and they, they took a, they were three of them, and they, they, they had them old, double action 45s, and they just took them, shot holes all through the steel, and they took an axe and just chopped it and bent it all up. One of these federal agents said, uh, 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 "Don't do nothing to that worm. It's, it's a cooling worm with put in the cooling barrel." Said, don't do nothing to that. Said, I want to keep that. Said, that's the biggest one I ever seen. <laughs> uh, and we used it on a, we had a 500 gallon <laughs> cooking pot that we used it on. And uh, I used to, I'd run that thing at night and uh, run that whiskey off. And uh, I took that steel after they got through with it and I sold it to the Allison boys for junk. Uh, it was junk copper. They paid so much. We used to buy scrap iron steel, cast iron, aluminum, copper. And I took it down there and sold it to the, El to the Ellison boys. I, I see uh, one of them was Hard Ellison and the other one was, uh, I don't exactly remember his name now. <laughs> and uh, I sold it to them down there at the junkyard. I sold that steel to them. Well, you probably got a lot of good out of it then. Yeah, we got we got a lot of good. Where were you born? In Ottawa, Kansas, a little town six miles east of Ottawa, about 65 miles, about 65 miles uh, uh, west of Kansas City. And when's your birthday? January the 21st, 1906. <coughs> See, today is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, we came here to Guthrie first from at Guyman, Oklahoma. My dad took a claim on uh, 160 acres, and he stayed there until he claimed it up, and he sold he sold it, and it was a good farm, at 160 acres, and it was just all oh, just it was just level the floor for good, and. Uh, uh, and he took claim on that, and he sold that 160-acre farm for $1,200. And we we took a lot of stuff we had, and we had quite a few horses, and we ha we had two teams. We put on two covered wagons, and then we led one or two horses behind, and we came to Guthrie. Huh. The first place we stopped was there, and we put our horses in the barn there, fed them there at, at Doc Tolman's. Uh, is there on Noble Street where the steakhouse is at now? Mm -hmm. Right across the street from the, is that the territorial mm -hmm. uh, eating place? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. We put them in there and fed them when we, when we came. We came in the winter time. Tell me about the trip from Diamond down here. Well, I remember I remember coming through Hitchcock, and uh, uh, I I just started the school that year, and. Uh, uh, And when when we came, we came in the wagon. They, some of those creeks and little creeks, they didn't have bridges across them. They, and we, you'd have to just small, and they had where you could just drive down and forward, but we got to drive through while every little water was running through with, with wagons and teams. But I did you have any scary moments? No, not really. Not really. What about the roads back then? Well, they wasn't nothing but dirt roads, and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of them on the smaller streams didn't have no bridges on them. How'd you know where you're going? Well, my grandma and grandpa lived here at Guthrie, oh, okay. and we was coming down here. But and the roads were marked. My, my which mother's way to go. dad and mother lived here in Guthrie. But huh? the roads were marked of which way to go? Yeah, they had they're just all county roads. That, but you, 
I mean, was the did they have road signs of which way? No, was no road or, signs. Of, but how'd you know where you were going? Well, <laughs> we just figured it out as we came. <laughs> <laughs> how long did that trip take? I don't remember just how long it did take. I uh, I remember walking along the fence roads and they'd take them posts out where they'd rot it off and put new posts in and they'd throw them down along the fence roads and we'd get that wood and we'd burn it. We had a stove in in uh, one of the covered wagons and we'd put it in and burn it to keep warm and warm up by. Uh, uh, mm. uh, and uh, and when, we, when we came here, we rented a... My dad rented a farm from uh, 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 18, it was it was uh, in the same section that joined Logan County, and it was two and a half miles, I think, north of Goodnight. A little town there named Good, Goodnight. They had a cotton gin, a grocery store, and I don't know what all they had there then. And that was in 1913. Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, the guy that owned the place was Ollie Anderson. Owned the place, and we rented it for him here in Guthrie. Some way, got a hold of it, and it was, he wanted somebody to rent it. Rented it. And uh, uh, we stayed down there for, uh, we stayed down there for 1913 and 1914. And then my dad and my oldest brother, uh, my dad started building grades for the tank farm over at Cushing. There's a big tank farm over there, and he's building the grades, and my oldest brother was backing up rivets. See, all them, all them tanks was put up with, all them tanks was put up with scaffolding and all done by hand, and hammers and hammers and backup weights. They'd stick them, my brother stick them weights in there and then clamp them up where it makes it solid, and then they'd rivet them with hammers on them tanks out there. Mm. That's the way that was that's the way that them tanks was built out there. If you did you ever see them over there at Cushion? South of? No, I've seen the tank farms up in northeast Oklahoma, but not the ones around Cushion. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then he what went What were those sisters names she was asking me about? Uh the Craven sisters. Are any of the Craven sisters still living? Um, uh let me see. Uh, that's Lavina Barnes and and uh, Clara Staggs and May Petit. Stagg and May Petit. Well, I think, I think maybe, I think Miss Staggs is still is in a rest home. I believe, I believe that Mrs. Staggs is, is in a rest home now. Is Miss Barnes gone? I think I think Miss Barnes passed away. Yeah, she didn't have to be about 106, 107 now. She was, she was still getting there. up around 100 years old. Yeah, she was 102 back in '82 when I interviewed her. Was she? Uh, I, I know she was. She was getting up. In, she was getting up in years. She sure enough was. Uh, but uh, Mrs. Stagg, Blanche Stagg, and May Petit. Yeah, I see. Now there was another one of them, I believe. Uh, yeah, there was a brother also, I think. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I knew that. I knew their brother. He lived up in Kansas. He used to yeah. come down here. Which one of those girls worked at the uh, territorial prison? At the prison, her husband was a jailer, and she used to cook the prisoners. I, I don't remember that. I, I remember when the, I remember, uh, my my grandmother owned a place just across from where the old federal prison was at, and uh, when they when they closed that down, uh, when I was I was in there seeing my grandma, and they closed it down and and moved it out of there. Well, I went all through that when, when they moved them out. They had old magazines and stuff in there and everything. And uh, uh, she lived there on North Second, uh, right there at this end of the Vidoc, down where that garage is at now. Mm -hmm. uh, the house, third house. There was, there was two houses on that big square house. Uh, was on the corner there, and. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Clark owned that corner building, and then the other one, uh, and then my grandma's place there. But they've got a, they've got a garage in there now, and they tore that, they tore both them other buildings down. There were two buildings north of that. She lived in the, 
farthest to the third house north of that. And the jail, they still had, I remember when I was down there, when they still they still had the prisoners, they still had the prisoners in the, in this jail down here, federal prisoners. And they they were they were in that. It's a what is it, a youth center now? Well, they had a teen town down teen. there for a while, and I think it's closed up now. Yeah. I don't know if it's being used now or not. Yeah, they, but the building's still. They there. they changed it around a lot. Yeah, but I I remember that old building. Do you know Chris Madsen? I know where I know where he lived. Uh -huh. Did you know him? At no, all? I didn't know him personally. No, mm -hmm. I didn't know Chris Madison. I, I heard a lot about him. Yeah. What about Rolla Goodnight? He's the one that founded the town of Goodnight. Yeah. Well, I I didn't know. I never did know anything about him. Huh? Uh, I never did know anything about Goodnight, but uh, I've heard about him. Yeah. Now, I heard that upstairs at the billiard hall was a whorehouse. I never did know about that. Not there where the billiard parlor's at now. I never did know about girls being up there. Uh, if there ever was any up there, I never did know about it. But down there at the Bluebell, hitting up over that alley bar down there, they just worked backwards and forwards in there. Is that where they had the, the walkway? Yeah, there was a walkway, and they tore it down, and they could go, they could go, go in that bill upstairs in that building, and go back over in the other building, or come from the other building back over in there to the upstairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I don't remember when the walkway was in there, but you can see where it was at. You can see where the where, where the walkway was at at there now, and where they took it, tore it out. Where they, uh, the guy had the old mobile. Uh, Nelson, uh, Kathy Nelson had that for a long time, and that <coughs> that uh, I think it tells when that Bluebell was built, and uh, the Blue Ribbon Brewing Company from Kansas City built that building there on the corner of the Bluebell there. And then the only one that I know that owned it afterwards was Kathy Nelson. Nelson or Hall? Kathy Nelson. Uh, I Nelson know Lucille and them owned it. Yeah, they, they, they bought it off. Well, uh, 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 I was trying to think of the guy they bought it from. They bought it off of Dave, uh, Dave Waller. Uh, they, they bought that house, they bought that off of, uh, Dave Waller bought that from Cappy. They sold that out when Cappy died. They sold that, they sold that building. And uh, uh, Dave Waller bought it. And then uh, uh, they got it from when Kathy Hall and them had it, and his wife, and I don't know, Albert had something to do with buying, I think, maybe. Albert, uh, that's uh, Lucille's son. And and they got it off of Dave Waller, and then they sold it to somebody when they started renovating these buildings here. And, but I was told that, I was told that the, Blue Ribbon Brewing Company out of Kansas City built that, built that building there. Ever hear any stories about Tom Mix working there? Well, I saw Tom Mix with a circus a couple of times. Yeah, Tom Mix worked, he worked someplace at a bar, a bar here, was barked in, and I think it was there. Yeah, that's at the Bluebell. At the Bluebell, Tom Mix was bartended in there. Uh, yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I'd get some more stories about early day Guthrie, you know, that you remember about Guthrie, what went on. Well, I, knew, I, knew, I, knew, I never did know anything about Guthrie much until <coughs> back in 1919, uh, I, I remember that uh, uh, when we come up here, uh, uh, 
Herb Spencer was the chief of police, and uh, uh, Ed Robertson was the sheriff, and A.V. Dinwiddie was the county attorney in 1919. A.V. Dinwiddie was the county attorney. Herb Spencer was a police chief, and Ed Robertson was a, was a sheriff here. Who was that mean one you talked about so many times about going out? Oh, shooting? Milo Beck. Oh, well, that's a story. At there. Milo Beck, I'm telling you, uh, 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 you talked to Milo Beck. Uh, uh, he come out and talked to me and my brother for about. He stayed there and talked for about an hour one time. And he, he never talked to a nicer fellow than Milo Beck. Was he a policeman or a police chief or what? He was the sheriff. Sheriff. And he was the first sheriff in Lo to hold the sheriff's office for three terms in Logan County. And uh, the way he got to be sheriff, uh, he, uh, uh, he was a Santa Fe Railroad bull down at the station at the bus at the depot. And uh, uh, Bice was, Bice moved, moved up to Roxana from Seminole, and he put a joint in up there, and they gambled, and he sold whiskey, and they said he sold old. And uh, uh, they said, uh, they said that a federal agent come down there to investigate him, and he never was heard of since. And, uh, and. Bert McKean was the sheriff, and Milo was a was a railroad bull for Santa Fe. So, and uh, old man Parker was Bert McKean's deputy, and uh, Bert had sent his he sent uh, uh, he sent uh, he sent his, uh, he sent his deputy and two of his deputies up there to arrest uh, By, and By told him. He said, if you want, if, if Bert McKean wants me arrested, he said, you just go back and tell him to come up here himself. And uh, uh, Charlie Swanson was one of his deputies, and uh, and Parker, it was a Parker, I think, a youth that, that had the hardware store. Uh, he was some of those Parkers. And uh, they got, they got almost up there, and, uh, uh, and Bert McKean, uh, uh, old man Parker was telling me about it, and he said that, that Bert stopped the car and said, uh, I want to talk to you. He said, you know what I, I decided to do? He said, I, I, decided, I, I, I decided to go down and get my little Beck and put him on as a deputy. And, and he said, well, if you do, he said, I'm quitting. He said, well, I can't help it. He said, I made up my decision. He said, that's what I'm going to do. And he went down and talked to Milo Beck, and Milo Beck said, "Yeah," I said, I said uh, "I'll go on as your deputy." And the first thing he done when he went on as deputy, he sent him up there to get by. And uh, they were, he was selling dope. He was selling dope in the school up there. And uh, the other guy got out, and he was sitting in the car. And uh, Milo took his wife up there with him. She was in the car with him, <coughs> and the school. It was on a corner there, and uh, uh, Bice drove up to the school there and stopped, and this other guy got out of his car and went into the school, and uh, Milo Beck was parked up on that side of the building, and uh, I, I remember some of them saying there when, when they gathered around him, uh, said, oh, get, 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 get back, get back, don't gather around him that way, he might not be dead yet. <laughs> and. Uh, and when and he he'd start, he'd just opened the door to get out of the car, and Milo shot him, and Milo shot him, and they brought him back in the hand. Milo went up there and got him. <laughs> he got him. So he was just deputized early for that purpose of going and getting him for the other guy. Yeah, Bert. And and uh, uh, they got two bank robbers up at Crescent, and that was when Bert was still a sheriff and Milo was a deputy. And they called and they recognized him and from the description. They called in to Guthrie, and so Bert and Milo went up there after these two bank robbers. <coughs> and uh, 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 when they got up there to go in, well, uh, 
uh, Bert's hands got shaken, and uh, so Milo just walked in there, and Milo said, they said that Milo walked in that cafe, and he said, don't nobody move, and they'll, nobody will get hurt. And uh, he had his pistol in his hand, and he'd pull that trigger <laughs> real quick. <coughs> and he just took them out and arrested them and brought them down and put them in Logan County Jail. And there was an old Negro, and his name was Moore. He lived out at Meridian. And uh, uh, they had a disturbance, and they called for the sheriff out there. And they went out there, and he took Lee Blakesley, and I think Dinwiddie went out with him. And he told Lee, he said, you go to the front door. He said, I'll go around to the back. And when he started around to the back, old Gov Moore had a sweet potato rose planted there. And Milo stepped in, in one of them sweet potatoes. He had ridges there. And he stepped in and fell. And uh, uh, old Gov Moore shot at him with a shotgun just as he fell. And he shot over his head. And he took off running across the road to another house over there. And Milo was right behind him. And the last words he said, he said, I just killed my little beggar, little Milo. He, he shot him in the head with a 45 bullet, went clear through his head. Oh, <laughs> mercy. That was, that was the last words of old Gov Moore. They all call him old governor, Gov Moore. And uh, uh, the last words, he, last words he said, he told him, he said, I just killed my little beg. And uh, <laughs> When did that happen, what year? Well, now let me. Let me see, it was, uh, it was long, about 35, 36, somewhere along there. <coughs> but uh, when Milo, when Milo killed that Rourke down at Oilton, uh, 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 they didn't have no law and order there in Oilton, they sent they sent Milo down, down there, and he was, old Milo was half Cherokee Indian, and he was tall, wore a black hat, always dressed in black, and uh, old Milo, they come down, they come down Main Street there in Oilton, and they were shooting the lights out. Milo Beck told them, he said, uh, he said, uh, he, he walked out there and told them to stop, and he said, get out of the car, and all of them got out but Rourke, and there was a, a, a handgun laying there in the seat. And Milo said, don't you reach for that just as he grabbed for it. And Milo killed him. Uh, I think they said Milo killed. I think uh, while he was in law enforcement, he killed seven, I think. I think Milo <laughs> Beck killed seven. But Milo went out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and put a station in right out in the west side of, uh, west edge of, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he died out there. And uh, they had uh, they had Lee Blakesley and A. V. Dinwiddie went out there as honorary pallbearers at his funeral. Mm. Uh, and that's but uh, Milo Milo run for sheriff for the fourth term, and uh, they had a boy from up by Crescent, and they had him for stealing some stuff. And Lee Blakesley and went up there and got him and brought him down, and he was up and talking to some of them up on the sidewalk and left him sitting there in the car. And, and Milo Manuel, uh, Manuel Beck had been out rabbit hunting, and he had a 22 rifle, and uh, uh, Lee Blakely, they, they told him to stay, and he, they left him sitting there in the car, and he got out and took off running. And, uh, uh, I don't know if Lee shot at him or not, but uh, the boy shot at him with a 22 rifle, and, and they took him to the hospital, and he died. And Emmanuel's boy killed him. Uh, uh, and uh, that's what beat Milo. He'd been, he he would have probably been elected sheriff. <laughs> He's probably been elected sheriff for the fourth term, if uh, if he hadn't. Uh, if that boy, but they didn't do nothing with the boy about it. Of course, uh, of course the boy wasn't even of age. He couldn't, he couldn't deputize the deputy because he has to be of an age, of age to be, be a deputy or a, a law enforcement officer. You can't be under age. But the boy shot the boy shot him with a 22 rifle and killed him.
He died, Susan Cost, and he died. Uh, but, oh, Milo, you never, you sat and talked to him, you always had a grin on his face, and, and he was he was a pretty solid character, but anybody anybody was an enemy, uh, they better be careful what they done around him because he didn't take no chances with them. If there's any shooting done, old Milo always shot first. <laughs> But that nigger, that nigger old Gov Moore out there at Meridian, he shot at Milo first. Uh, he's going around to the back, and, the, and this negro come out the back door with a shotgun, and he shot at Milo, and he thought he hit him when he fell, and he fell in that, and he shot over him with a shotgun, and missing to somebody coming around and meeting him with a shotgun, and he just, and he was, he was kind of excited himself, so uh, he just blasted at him. And he and he shot over his head and he fell. <laughs> and and he, he, he went he went across the road, the house over there just went in and Milo was right behind him. And he said, I just killed Milo Beck. <laughs> you mentioned the Jim Crow law. Tell me about that. Well, uh, Bill Murray put that in the Constitution when they wrote the Constitution for the state of Oklahoma. And uh, he was the president of the Constitutional Convention. Oh, Bill Murray was a pretty educated man. And I, I went and listened to him when he was running for governor. And when he was running for governor, he said that, uh, you, if you remember, they impeached, uh, they impeached uh, uh, Walton when he was governor. And then Johnson got in from, he lived in Perry, and he got in as governor, and uh, they impeached Johnson. And old Bill Murray was running for office, and he said that, and and there was a good crowd there, a big crowd there, and listened to him make his speech when he speak, made a speech here at Guthrie. And he told the people what he would do if he was governor. He said, if you, if you elect me for governor, he said, I'll open every toll bridge in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, he said that some of those, the, they, they floated bonds, sold bonds to build those toll bridges, and then when they paid off, they were supposed to go back to the state, see? And he said that, that uh, he, he spoke of one, uh, I think it was across the South Canadian, and he said it had been paid off for 12 years, and he said they were still charging toll on it. And he said it was supposed to go back to the people. And he said, you elect me for governor, he said, and I'll open all the toll bridges. Well. Uh, uh, but in his speech, he said, now, uh, th this political bunch that's running things now, he said, they impeached Walton. He said, they impeached Johnson. He said, if you elect me for governor, he said, and they tried to impeach me, he said, it'll just be like throwing a bunch of jackrabbits into a wildcat. And he was telling the truth. And uh, uh, him and Lou Wiggs, now, Lou Wentz was supposed to be the richest man in the state of Oklahoma, and he was head of the Highway Commission, and, and he, wanted to, he wanted to do some road building, and Bill Murray didn't want it, and so he said, well, we're going ahead with it anyhow. And Bill Murray told him, said, uh, Bill Murray told him, said, uh, you have your, all your stuff out of the state building, by the coming Saturday, and he was talking. He was talking to Lou about the most powerful man in the state, and and Lou Wentz had all his. He had all his belongings out of the state building on Saturday, and uh, uh, and that Oklahoma City sheriff and his deputy come up there, and old Bill Murray. I think he, he was sitting there, had a chew of tobacco, and. and uh, uh, that when they got through a talking, oh, when they got through a talking, uh, old Bill Murray told them, said, uh, uh, get out or I'll throw you out. And they left. They, the sheriff and the deputy just took off and left. When Bill Murray, when he listened to him talk, he said, get out or I'll throw you out. And he had men there would, he, he had men there would throw them out. They would take them out dead or alive. <laughs> now, old Bill Murray, old Bill Murray was a solid character. And what he told the people he would do before he was elected governor, before they elected him, he'd done everything right up to the minute that he said he would do.
Yeah. Uh, I understand he called the National Guard out several times around the Capitol building. Well, I don't know anything. Well, he turned the gas on. Uh, I see the the, uh, the, the uh, uh, times was hard then, and everybody just had to root hog or die. And uh, 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 they turned the gas on, and he called uh, uh, he called the National Guard out, and had the National Guard to turn the gas on uh, to all those people where they turned the gas off because they didn't pay their bills. <coughs> now I don't know whether that was right or wrong, but they they didn't have no heat or nothing, and it was right in the dead of winter, and they turned the gas off on because they wouldn't pay their bills. And uh, uh, Bill Murray had the National Guard to go in and turn and turn the gas on. Now that's the only time he had the National Guard. But when they when they built the bridge, when they built the bridge between uh, Denison, Texas, and and Medill, Oklahoma, on the Red River down there, well, uh, the, the, it was a joint it was a joint job down there. Texas and Oklahoma built it together, built the bridge, and when when. Bill Murray went down there to open the bridge. Well, uh, the Texas stopped him because they owned half of the bridge. See, they had, they they, they was, they was in the havers on that. So uh, Bill Murray just went down there, and 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 put out a contract to build a bridge. It's just a block down. It's just a block down from the old toll bridge. And it's last time I was down there, it was still down there. The old bridge was up here. It's a block, a block west of the free bridge. And and he, he he called the National Guard. The National Guard went down there and kept the peace while they built the new bridge across there. And when they got the new bridge built, well, he just blockaded the one to the blockaded the one to the toll bridge. And and then uh, 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 Texas had to put approach to the free bridge where they could get across from Oklahoma into Texas. Uh, that's that's how that bridge got built. <laughs> what about when they shut the oil fields down? Well, uh, uh, I I never did know too much about that. Now Cicero was a nephew, a cousin of his, and Cicero had a whole lot to do with that. And uh, uh, I never did know too much about that. And uh, uh, but I I do know uh, now Bill Murray's son was elected governor. Uh, uh, Johnston. Johnson Murray. Uh, uh, he uh, he was elected, but he was elected governor. He was elected governor on uh, Bill Murray's reputation as a governor. And uh, uh, you didn't want to you didn't want to talk you didn't want to talk Bill Murray to no colored people because colored people just hated him. They boy they hated him for putting that Jim Crow law in. Now what does that Jim Crow law do? Uh, separate the blacks from the whites. And they had to live in these separate, separate places, and they couldn't live. They they had south part of Oklahoma City or different parts of it. They could live there, and Guthrie they could live in different parts of Guthrie, and they weren't supposed to live no place else. And they had separate waiting rooms at the depots, and nobody had cars then. What about the trains coming into the state? What about? Well. Uh, they had the passenger trains, and they run daily. Some of them was locals, and the, through trains of Santa Fe going through here. But at one time, the at one time there was a, I forget how many railroads there was coming into Guthrie. There was a Fort Smith and Western come out of uh, Fort Smith into Guthrie, and the Rock Island went down through Coyle. And good night, and over to Perkins, and down through that away was the Rock Island, and the Fort Smith and Western, and the Katy. But I, they was more railroads than that come into Guthrie. Now you mentioned the blacks could ride anywhere on the train up north. In Kansas they yeah. could. In Kansas they didn't have no Jim Crow law in Kansas, and they could ride there, but. When they come to the line, well, when they come to the state line, they'd all have to go back and they'd all have to go back in the train to go back to the to the it's Negro car. It, it's separate. It's Jim Crow law is what enforced that. And the ones that didn't go, the ones that didn't go when they come to the station, the railroad bulls there, and they just get them and take them to jail. 
we, we got a colored man living here, here now. Now, last year he was a superintendent at the high school. And uh, somebody said he, I don't, he said, he, for a colored man, I, I ain't by treat me nice, I treat him nice. And uh, he's, a, he's an awful nice acting fella. He's an awful nice, friendly, and nice acting fella. And uh, he's uh, in the administration building now. They took him out as principal. And he's uh, and somebody and <coughs> somebody on the in the school board said he had a, he got, got a drug problem. <coughs> so you must be talking about Goldston. Goldston, yeah. He lives right next door there. Goldston lives there. <coughs> yeah, but uh, he never seen a nicer fella than him. Just talk to him, but. I, I don't know much about him. I just uh, see him out there. He always speaks. And, and <coughs> but uh, I heard that he, him and his wife are separated. Uh, I don't make that none of my business. I I try to tend to my own business near as I can and let them take care of theirs. <laughs> Huh. What was your father's name? Sylvester. Sylvester Graves? Yeah. And who was your mother? Uh, Nellie Walmsley. Walmsley? Walmsley. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Were they both from Kansas? Yeah, they both they, they both come down here from Kansas. <coughs> Do you know if either one of your grandfathers was in the Civil War? Uh, yeah, my granddad was in the Civil War. And... Uh, we did have a, uh, my brother had a family record out there, but I don't know if his nephew's got it or not. I'll have to ask him and see if he got that when my brother died. Now, which grandfather was that? As my grandfather Graves. What was his name? His, his name was, uh, 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 oh, Samson, Samson Graves. Samson Graves. Samson. Which side did he fight on? He fought on the, with the Yankees. He was that, and it, and, and it, it I, I remember reading that, and uh, he uh, it, it tells all the different battles that he was in when he was in the Civil War. And, uh, uh, but the first, where we first started keeping the family record was uh, uh, John Graves, and he was, he, he was born and raised until he was up of age in, in Germany. He was a German immigrant here to this country. But he went to England. He didn't like, he didn't like the, he didn't like the churches in Germany, and he went to England and he married an English, uh, an English woman over in England, and they went, and and they came over here, and they settled in Tennessee, and he was a soldier in George Washington's army, uh, and uh, they had 17 children. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <coughs> they were 17 children. And uh, uh, I read the names of a lot of them, uh, the girls that married. And one of them married a Ham, one of them married a Kissinger, and uh, uh, one of them married a Magruder. <laughs> and uh, I just don't remember. Uh, I, I, I read it, but uh, but old John, uh, old John lived to be. A hundred and three years old, a hundred and three. And uh, uh, now my grandfather, he went out to California in, in 1849 the gold rush, and he came back, and he came back on a ship back down as close as he could get to Tennessee, and then he came on up to Tennessee, and and then the, he... Uh, that was this Samson Graves? Yeah, uh-huh. Did he ever, did you know him? No. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember seeing him and my grandmother, yeah. Any stories about the gold rush to California? Well, about the only thing I ever heard anything about is about when he, he came back. He came back with a boat uh, uh, back down and and uh, came back to Tennessee. And then he went back up to uh, Atchison, Atchison, Kansas. That's where they, they left from Atchison, Kansas, and went to California in 49 the gold rush and that's the way he got back and he got back and then he, and then he was in the uh, 
he was in the Civil War. And but it, it tells it tells different battles that he was in. But I don't know whether <laughs> it's everybody to their own opinion whether the colored people should be set free or kept slaves. <laughs> But uh, oh, Abraham Lincoln was the president then, and he said that a nation couldn't stand divided, and about half of about half of the country was for the South, and about half was for the North, and they they they'd bring those in from Africa and sell them over in auctions, just like they have these yard sales here, and the auctions, and they'd sell them over, sell them, people would buy them through the auctions, as the way the people in the South had those Negroes, the Negroes. And they would buy them, and and uh, of course they'd run off and everything. <laughs> Were there any former slaves here in Guthrie that you knew? No, I didn't know anybody that was a slave. I never did know any of them that were slaves. But I do, I do know that. I do know that uh, they they they'd sure cross you up if you started talking something good about Bill Murray. <laughs> yeah, Bill Murray, he's Jim Crow. <laughs> Yeah, I. Uh, do you know where those pool, the uh, snooker tables came from in the hall in the building over there? The, the ones that invented the door. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't know, but I imagine Bernie Merton or whoever he got from brought them from the Brunswick people. They're all Brunswick, aren't they? The large table, Brunswick built the Brunswick table, pool table. Yeah, the ones that are in there now, the ones that came from the Vincent door. Bernie Merton's, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. You know when he opened the Vincent door? No, I don't. I don't know when. It was open the first time I ever knew it was open. It was open uh, when I first started coming to Guthrie, and that was in 1919, and it was open then in 1919, mm -hmm. and it was it was open and it was and it was still and it stayed open until uh, they moved it. They moved it over there where it's at now, and John Gooch is the one that moved it. And Dan Gooch used to go in there and play billiards and pool all the time, and, uh, uh, yeah. Anyone else besides Minnesota Fats coming in that you know of? That's the only one I know of that had any, uh, that, was, that was really a, a real pool shooter that came in and Played and Ray Wicks went over there and played him, and I, I talked to Ray Wicks about playing him, and he said, he said that, uh, he said that he didn't much more than just hold a stick to it, and he, I guess he was, uh, he was, uh, I guess he was pretty good sh shooter. <laughs> yeah. Buck Eldridge ever come in there? I knew Buck Eldridge, yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, uh, well, I don't know too much about him. He had that station down there uh, on South Division, and he ran that station down there for years. And Before the station, do you remember the bar he used to I, have? I, I remember the, no, I don't remember. I don't remember uh, of him having a bar, but he had that filling station. It's down on South Division. It's uh, it sets off to itself. It's on the west side of the street there on Division, and I think it's a key something keys uh, something there now. Uh, key supply or something like that. And he he run that he run that station down there for years here in Augusta. But I think they. I think they did have a bar up at, was it Red Rock? Uh, it was, I think it was up at Red Rock. I think he had, the, I think he, I think he had a, uh, a saloon. Uh, I think it was at Red Rock. When did he come to Guthrie? I, 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 I don't know just when he did come here. He, but that, that he did have a bar and it was at Red Rock as well. But he, Someone I think, told me he had one of the first saloons in Guthrie. I don't know. I don't know nothing about the saloon. 
Uh, see, they the, the only way you can get whiskey is through a doctor's prescription. Is, uh, uh, back back then, you could get it through a, a doctor's prescription after they got prohibition. Ever hear any stories about at statehood when they closed all the saloons of what they did with all the whiskey? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I think they, I, I just don't know. I, I, I just don't know what they did with it, well, how they managed it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's enough for this time. We I'd like to come back next week. Okay. I'd like to take you up to the billiard hall up there sometime and let you explain what it used to look like in the old days sometime <laughs> next week. Well, I'll come back in there. I, 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 I won't have no trouble with Frank now. But I was smoking. He's hollering about me smoking. He said, don't you never ask me to get in the gym king. He said, you're smoking them cigars. And all at once he just reached over and he just, with his hand, he just hit me in the face like I was trying to knock the cigar out of my mouth. And uh, said the smoke was bothering him. And uh, we had a little trouble. Uh, I, uh, okay. I'm, I'm kind of a nervous disposition myself. And I, I, when he when he done that, I jumped up and I started drawing my fist back and I started to hit him, and he had a pair of glasses on, and uh, I, I, that's the first thing I seen was them pair of glasses, and he was sitting in the chair there after he done it, and if it hadn't been if it hadn't have been if he hadn't had those glasses on, uh, I, I, I'm really not in no shape to be a fighting, but uh, uh, what he done, and just about me and not asking him to play in be a smoking anymore and that blowing that smoke in his face that fan was and he just reached over and knocked it out of my mouth is what he done and uh, uh, it didn't sit very good for him but I them that say if they can't stand it when I get in the game and say anything about you smoking I said well if you're going to play I, I just won't smoke I, I won't smoke but nothing was never said about it and then he just knocked it out of my mouth. No, because when you uh, tell Clyde as much bothering you, he uh, normally does I didn't, <laughs> uh, I, I never thought a thing about it. And he come as complaining about it. And, and I just kept on smoking that in my mouth. And kept on smoking it. And I, uh, I didn't think he had no business doing that. He could wait until the game was over and quit. That's the way I would have done it if it had been me. I wouldn't. Reach over and knocked it out of anybody's mouth. You smoke cigarettes. Next time you smoke cigarettes, I'm in there. I'm just going to reach over and tell you that smoke's getting mine. Just reach over and knock it out. <laughs> I didn't think that was a very nice thing to do. Uh, uh, I, I was pretty much always uh, figured on taking care of myself. Uh, when you get past 80 years old, well, you. You, you just kind of you just kind of discard that fighting, <laughs> but you can still have a temper. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I want you to listen to it. And and it, it never has been in the garage. It never has been in the garage except to get a new set of tires, a new set of tires. Thirty.
three and a half miles to the gallon on gas. What are these things? What are you working on here? Oh, I, I'd worked on that, and I started out to try to make something that run by itself. Now, I balanced that up. I had that balanced up, and I put bearings in here, and I, I tried to work it with that. And I got that where it would run, uh, where it would run for. Uh, uh, I balanced it up, and I got it balanced to where, where I could take my hand. I could take my hand the best I had it. I've had it balanced where I could take my hand and spin it and spin it like that, and it would run for 14 minutes. It run for 14 minutes without stopping when I had it balanced. I, I've been fooling with it. Now, Maybe. what are you trying to make? Well, I'm trying to make something that will keep it running by throwing, by taking the weight off of one side and going on the other and make it run by itself without any electricity. You mean a perpetual motion perpetual machine? Perpetual motion. Uh -huh. Well, are you going to succeed? Well, I don't know. I, I'm going to try this way. I think this thing will keep it running the way I'm fixing it now, trying it. But I've tried for it everything. And, uh, uh, I tell you what, uh, it's not it's not as easy to make something like that, but I haven't decided it can't be done yet. But uh, what's the other machine over there? Well, that's the same thing I was working on, and this over here, and this over here. Uh, now, now these are these are generator bearings here. Now that that's on the shaft here, and it's all the same. And this here are coming this way. Now, what, what I was, I was going to try to make this one for, uh, uh, with this and put this on here and push it on a ratchet, see, and, and push it over to keep the weight coming up and going that way and put it on where it run straight and put it there, but it, uh, you you think you get it where it would run? Yeah, you think you get it where it run? Now, if you if you stand it right straight up, you can stand it right you can stand that right straight up on top of it, and when and when it goes over, and and, and uh, when when it's going this way, if you get it, just balance balance it on balance it on there right square over that this one here as it goes this way, and it and it stays that way, it'll it, this one will start coming down. And this one will turn this way, see. But when you get to, to see it kills all of it when when you put it this way and put your put your bearing to hold it here. Now, uh, uh, you, you can't put the weight over here, see, like this coming out. Because it it kills the weight here. But if you put the if you put two weights in here, one turning that way and one turning this way on here, and pull it in as a wedge over this and put this one down farther. And I was going to try that on it, but I just never have got around to it. I find so many other things that's easier to do. <laughs> but I'm just working on it, and uh, it's it's something it, it's something that uh, uh, it's kind of prehistoric. I'll tell the truth about it <laughs> because people have talked about. Uh, they, they've talked about perpetual motion uh, ever since I can remember, but they ain't nobody, and they decided that they couldn't be done, that they couldn't make anything. But now on this, I'm going to put, I'm going to put one from right here, right straight down. Now that line there was, that line, these lines here was all drawn across, and them was all precision. They're all the same all the way around. But I'm going to put it from this one right here, this one right here, this, this right straight down, right here to this, from that one to this one. And this one here is cut out on uh, on that side, and and this one here will be cut out to here, see, over here. And this one will, will stay on the bottom when that one's at the top. And that, this one won't pick up the weight until it comes over to here. And this one here, the weight will roll over to there when it comes on center. When that one comes on center there, at the top, this this bearing here will roll over here, and. And this one on the bottom, uh, the one on the bottom, will pick up. And then it'll pick up right here, see. And the other one will be coming down here, see. 
and uh, uh, making a break in that. I, I just don't know what it will do. I'm going to try it and see. And I'm going to put one on the bottom and one on the top, and the one on the top going that way, and the other one uh, coming back. And, and then it pick, it'll pick it up. It'll pick it up right here. Cause this one comes over. This one will come on over here, and this other one will roll back here. And this one will roll off here over to there. I'm going to fix that that way and just see what I'll do. And put a bearing in here and let it move. Let it move where, it's, where it will move. And just as soon as that, just as soon as that comes to there, as soon as that comes to there, it'll roll over here. See, and it'll go down to the bottom. And the one that's in the bottom there will, will roll back and stay on the bottom. Same as if one changes on top. And I, I, I don't know. If it does, I'll have you come up and take a picture of it. Okay. I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead and, I thought I'd go ahead and finish that up that way. Yeah. And see, I put these pieces on here to hold, hold, those, hold the bearings in the side of them. I did have bearings in all of them, and I cut them on. I cut them, I made a saw, I made a saw, I cut that on. And, uh, and that, that, that fits right around there like, like that, see. And I just drop those, drop those bearings right, drop those bearings right in there, see. Three quarter inch bearings here. They got room to roll. And on this one here, on this one here, when one rolls, when it comes on center right here, see, see that one, that one will go, will, will go over to there. That one will roll over to there. And and it, it, it'll throw it out of balance and then it'll carry it on over. And when you come back in, I'm going to put two right across. Okay, Mr. Graves, thank you. Yeah, you bet.